The title of my talk is listed in the schedule as Organelle and Symbiont, What's the Difference? And I think the answer is A, who cares? And B, probably if I you know, were forced to give an answer, you know, somebody points a gun at my head to so give an answer, I'd say organelles, meaning chloroplasts, mitochondria, and secondary plastids, are extremely significant for the overall course of eukaryotic evolution and eukaryotic genome evolution, whereas endosymbionts are interesting and numerous, but don't really seem to contribute as much. So, this is a movie that I made several years ago, and this is sort of what I'd like to talk about. The, the, the title of the program is what? Origins and Trajectories of Organelles? This is Origins. So this is a theory that I proposed for the origin of mitochondria and the origin of eukaryotes simultaneously. This is a methanogen. It works on the basis of anaerobic centrophy, okay? A, a phenomenon well known in anaerobic environments. This is a hydrogen-consuming, methane-producing archibacterium, probably a methanogen in the model. This is a sugar pill-eating, hydrogen-producing, fermenting bacterium that also is able to respire, but these two cells meet, it's a facultative anaerobe, under anaerobic conditions, and you get anaerobic centrophy, a metabolic couple linking this cell to this one, and so they uh, sort of like uh, methanobacillus omelanskii, right? Glucose in methane out, running two cells. And then we get my favorite mechanism here, endosymbiotic gene transfer. That's a term that we've heard a lot here. I coined that term in 1993 in a very nice journal named PNAS. And you see those blue genes that just came in? That is gene transfer in the course of endosymbiosis, and somehow, magically, that cell gets inside this other prokaryote. This is an archibacterium. It's not a eukaryote. That is not engulfment. That transition was lipids being changed because we've got lipids over here, genes for lipid biosynthesis. Uh, we've seen lots of uh, examples from the endosymbionts and the insects showing how uh, the, um, uh, you can get cells living within other cells without the host being a, a eukaryote. These blue genes, these chimeric chromosomes, we have archibacterial genetic apparatus and archibacterial ribosomes expressing both archaeal and bacterial genes in this cytosol. There is no nucleus. And these genes, if they're expressed, give rise to functions of bacterial origin in the eukaryotic cytosol. Okay, so when we're talking about this model versus Mike Gray's, this is about mitochondrion and the cytosol, not just about the mitochondrion. That's the nucleus. It looks a little bit like a golf ball. I asked them to, if they could do it a little bit better, and they said that would be another $2,000. So I said, well, okay, we'll live with the golf ball. And uh, the, the, it's interesting, just indicating that the origin of the nucleus postdates the origin of the mitochondria in this model because mitochondria give you the energy that is required to finance the differences that separate the eukaryotes from the prokaryotes, and this little flagellum uh, comes out of nowhere and the not from a spirochete symbiont, and they, they swim off into the sunset. Okay, so that's the model, okay, that I've been, been interested in for the past few years, and we've been trying to investigate various aspects of it. Now, everybody else in their talk, you know, they go through the slides, and then down here at the bottom somewhere, you'll see them, some little citation. Well, it's a short talk, and I'm not quite so subtle. So here are our citations. These are the types of things that we've been thinking about on this topic recently. The hydrogen hypothesis is the name of that theory. Uh, we, it involves gene transfer to the nucleus during endosymbiosis, a topic that I've worked uh, extensively on. Uh, lots of genes were transferred uh, um, uh, during evolution, and the name of the process, endosymbiotic gene transfer, has been reviewed. Uh, this is a nice paper with Martin Embley showing that one of the predictions of the model that all the eukaryotes would have mitochondria uh, was actually fulfilled. Uh, this is a nice paper with Eugene interest explaining how we can um, address the origin of the nucleus uh, because of, as a consequence of introns spreading in eukaryotic nuclear genes. And then in the last few years, I've been more and more interested in, in very early evolution, origin of life. But uh, this week, we had a nice paper up here that is, relative, that is related to this paper here on the origins of halo archaea via gene transfer. And this is 
Chuan, who's here, and Mayo, who's here, and Nelson, Shiju Nelson Sati, who's not here because he couldn't get a visa to attend, unfortunately. So what are we going to talk about? Um, uh, these are some of my friends, Jim Lake, Martin Emley, Nick Lane, Tal Gan, uh, Eugene Coonan, James McInerney, John Allen, Louis Thielens. I wish more of them could have been here, but they couldn't. A couple of developments that have, uh, in the field that I think have been important recently was the finding that the eukaryotes, when we use more advanced methods of phylogenetic al analysis, actually branch within the archaea, not as their sisters. That's a major change in the field. And James McKinnerney has been doing a lot on chimerism in eukaryotic genome evolution. Just wanted to point that out since they couldn't be here. So, halophiles. Where are we going with this talk? We're going to talk, or trying to give a couple of examples underpinning the case that gene transfer in evolution, massive gene transfer from bacteria to archaea does occur and that it correlates with major evolutionary transitions among the prokaryotes. The first case example, because that's the prediction of the model. Right, that the, 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 the host was an archaean, the mitochondrial endosymbiont was a bacterium, there was massive gene transfer, tra uh, transfer transforming the uh, archaeal host into a eukaryotic nuclear cytosolic compartment and a bipart bipartite cell. So does that gene transfer occur? These are halophiles, these are salterns, and uh, the red color comes from bacterial rhodopsin, which is the photosynthetic pigment that halophiles have. They live in basically LB medium with 5 molar sodium chloride, and they're happy. And in phylogenetic trees, the halophiles are derived methanogens. If we believe the trees, the tree doesn't show up very well here. This is one by Eugene Coonan. The halophiles have always been known as derived methanogens, but the problem is that the methanogens are strictly anaerobic, chemolithoautotrophic, prokaryotes that live off of gases. They live off of hydrogen, CO2, nitrogen, and H2S, and a few salts. The halophiles are aerobic heterotrophs. Basically, they have the same phys physiology as a human, right? They, they eat uh, sugars, and they have a respiratory chain. And if they're derived from methanogens, well, then we, we have to go the whole spectrum of physiology from strictly anaerobic chemolithoautotrophs to aerobic heterotrophs. I like to say, sounds like a role for point mutation. Um, no, it's gene transfer. So we took a look at this, and we're trying to compare genomes in the broad scale to get as accurate a picture as we can from the top down, rather than looking at individual trees, trying to look at larger patterns. So these are 55 archaea that are completely sequenced in this analysis. These are 1,000 bacteria. And the colors indicate the number of genes, not the proportion, the number of genes that are shared between these genomes, okay? So this number is, I think, 800 over here. That means that these halophiles share, these are archaea, they share about 800 genes apiece with organisms from this group here. These are clostridia, and they share about 800 genes out here with this group here, and here's the beta proteobacteria and the alpha proteobacteria, we see that there are very discrete patterns of ar different archaea that share genes with different groups of bacteria. And it's large numbers. So we wanted to know what's going on there. There's a lot of other stuff going on here, but that's not the focus. The focus right now is halo archaea, okay? Where they have lots of bacterial genes, or where do these bacterial genes come from? To make a long story short, we clustered them and made phylogenetic trees for all genes in all archaeal genomes that either had bacterial homologs or did not have bacterial homologs. And then we looked at the trees to see how often the haloarchaea branched within the bacteria or only with bacteria to the exclusion of archaea. That's what we were looking for. And we actually found 1,089 trees where that was the case, where the haloarchaea had as their nearest sister, their, number one, they were monophyletic, the haloarchaea were monophyletic and branched either within the bacteria or the bacteria were the only other uh, species in the tree. Those are clearly genes that are more similar between haloarchaea and bacteria than they are to other archaea. Those are acquisitions. And those acquisitions entail mostly metabolic functions. That should not come as a surprise because the, the backbone of 
microbial life in the prokaryotic world is physiology, not morphology. And uh, importantly, we see things like this. This is the respiratory chain uh, of the halophiles. It's distributed as, you know, complex one, complex two, complex three, and complex four. There's also an ATPase. It's the archaeal ATPase, though, not the bacterial ATPase. And the important thing about this figure here is that it shows that this gene transfer, well, we've got statistical tests to show that the, the, the transfer has basically all occurred at once, not in individual lineages. But if you have a respiratory chain like this, it has to be mass acquisition, sort of a single event, similar to the origin of mitochondria, because any one of these individual genes, if it's acquired, is useless. It will mutate and it will become a pseudogene. You have, in order to, to get an entire respiratory chain functioning, by the way, in an archaeal membrane, and the methanogens do not have quinones, but the halophiles do have menaquinones, so not only the respiratory chain, also the menaquinone biosynthetic pathway, so major uh, physiological transformation. These, uh, the unity of this, uh, uh, the, the requirement to have a functional unit indicates that the transfers occurred on block, not piecemeal. That's interesting. Okay, we thought that was interesting. So, uh, right. So that's our that's our result here. A thousand halo archaeal genes. But what about the rest? Okay, we only looked at the archaea there, at the archaea there, and that's the paper that appeared yesterday in Nature, and it's getting a lot of nice press. And that's work by Nelson uh, by Shiju Nelson Sati again. So, what about the other stuff? This is showing us the. Uh, as much of the, and I want to go through the last four or five slides kind of slowly to show you what we're looking at and what we're doing, okay? It's unique. Nobody else is doing this, and um, so it takes some getting used to, but I think we will get used to it because it shows us a lot. These are trees. This is 17,000 trees of genes that only occur in archaea and do not occur in bacteria. So what we've done now is we've taken, oh, the numbers, the numbers. Chuan, how many archaea? It's 75 archaea and 1,800 bacteria and clustered them and, and made the trees. So these are the, these are the archaea. And what you can see here are these groups of archaea yeah, that share genes, sort of group-specific gene-sharing patterns. Here, here we have uh, almost 4,000 genes that only occur in the halophiles in no other archaea and in no other bacteria. So we've got genomes over here, and each of these lines here on the abscissa is a gene, and it's a maximum likelihood phylogeny underpinning it. So we can tell you whether these are monophyletic or non-monophyletic, and we can tell you all sorts of information about the branching patterns and, and what's going on here because our computers have gotten very good at, reading, at making and reading these files. So it's interesting to see that you know, these sulfalobales and the thermococcales and methanobacteriales, who cares that we see these you know, specific gene-sharing patterns? Well, it's actually important because what it tells us is that these groups are real. Okay, all of the philosophers just freaked out. He said real. They really exist? Yes, they're real. Okay, these are genes that these, these bacteria, these prokaryotes share only among themselves and with none others. Now, if that's not evidence for a real prokaryotic group, I don't know what is. And it's the, it's the, predominant, uh, the predominant pattern that we observe here. There are some genes here. These are, these are only possessed by one group. These are shared by two groups, okay, and three groups and more. Ah, you see this black line over here on the end? Those are the genes that are universal to all genomes, okay, in the archaea. This is what we've been calling the tree of 1%. Now, there are a lot of people debating the branching pattern of these trees in the hope that they would have some sort of a proxy for what's going on in the other 99%. And I'm saying, can we just look at the other 99% directly in such a way that we can get it on a DNA4 piece of paper so that I can look at it? And the answer is, yes, we can. We can do that. And so it's interesting that there is no evidence for um, hierarchical clustering in this data whatsoever. So in that respect, Ford is right. There is no evidence for, of any sort, and you can look for it, you can look for it hard, and with statistics and trees, there is no evidence for hierarchical clustering here. They're just groups, somehow organized in nature with an unknown, uh, an unknown branching pattern. 
Now, those are the group-specific genes. What happens if we look at the genes that archaea share with bacteria? That's this. And we see the halophiles again, okay, that's the PNAS story all over again, but we also see that all of these other major archaeal groups have 385, 128, 100, 130. The origin of all the major archaeal groups correspond to gene acquisitions from bacteria. Wow, that was interesting. Do we see a pattern here? Is, there, is it really true that all of these uh, archaeal groups owe their origin to bacterial gene acquisitions? Well, we've, we've got a test where we can see if the genes uh, that the bacteria of bacterial origin and the genes of archaeal origin that we just saw on the last slide have the same phylogeny. And for six of these taxa, the test indicates that the phylogeny of the bacterial genes and the phylogeny of the archaeal genes is indistinguishable in terms of the distributions of trees, the, distri uh, the, 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 two, the two sets of trees are drawn from the same distribution, and what that indicates is that it's not a gene entering into the one archaeal lineage and being passed around because then the, the phylogenies would be very different, rather it's single origin. So that's kind of, an, again here, in the, we see a recurrent pattern, right? We said, is this some sort of artifact? No, because the groups are real, and it's just that the bacterial genes also reflect the same groups. And um, it's uh, noteworthy that 83% of the gene transfers that we see are into methanogen lineages, Right? The methanogens were the recipients. Either they remained methanogenic or they transformed their um, physiology. And furthermore, we see at least a 5 to 1 preponderance, 5 to 1 um, excess of gene transfers from bacteria to archaea over vice versa. We can't say exactly why that is, but that's what we see. My suspicion is because the methan that the two observations are linked. Number one, we have a very strong signal from the halophiles here. And it's because methanogens are very simple. They're hydrogen dependent, CO2 reducing, nitrogen fixing, um, the hydrogen sulfide requiring chemolith autotrophs, and the only way for them to evolve physiologically is up, okay? They can't get simpler. They can only get more complex, and I think it's that physiology that dictates, that determines the, uh, the vector of transfer. So if we make a tree of this, that is, uh, we try to get the branching pattern sort of for the archaea. This is, you see these branches get thinner here. That's what we call the uh, disappearing tree phenomenon because uh, if you have 70 genes and concatenate them, you get a very nice phylogeny with nice bootstrap values, but if you look at the genes individually, they don't really support this phylogeny. And we see the acquisitions coming into the different lineages, apparently from many different sources, but uh, we discussed that a little bit yesterday in, in Andrew Rogers' talk. It looks like these genes come from many different sources, but there are lots of factors that could determine uh, uh, that, for example, it could be that these genes came in in a single event from a single bacterium and since have been passed around to different sources. Uh, this big branch here that we see to the halophiles is actinobacteria. Okay, can we do this for eukaryotes? That's the question. Organelles. The answer is yes. So, um, eukaryotes have, boy, Sean, uh, uh, Chuan, correct me, I think it's something like 30,000 gene clusters with uh, in, in total and, and uh, with two, and uh, I think it's 13,000 with more than two. So these are eukaryotic gene clusters here. So we've done the same thing. We've clustered eukaryotic genes and merged them with the prokaryotic genes so that we have two sets of genes, the genes that eukaryotes only share among themselves and the genes that eukaryotes share with prokaryotes. That's the last slide. Now this is interesting because if you look at the eukaryotic gene sharing patterns, it looks very similar to what we just saw for the archaea. We have not done the bacteria yet, that yet to be done, in that we have lots of group specific gene sharing patterns. These are plants, these are uh, opisthocons, these are some of the uh, 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 strominopiles and alveolates over here. And you can see that we have a sort of a, similar to the archaea, some pretty clear patterns, but we also have things where the, uh, the groups have uh, more, there's more evidence for phylogeny among the eukaryotes. You can see these plants and the strominopiles, or plants and strominopiles and alveolates, or here are opisthocons with uh, amoebozoa down here. There are some 
There is at least half of the data provides some evidence for structure, phylogenetic structure among the groups, and that might be an interesting way to look at phylogenetic patterns, but that's not our concern. Our concern is organelle origins. So we want to know, okay, just, just to remind you here, patterns of phylogeny in eukaryotes, no patterns of phylogeny in the archaea. And for the bacteria, we have yet to do it. All right, so last two slides, what happens when we do the prokaryotes in? There is a lot to say about this figure. This is the universe of genes that eukaryotes share with prokaryotes, where you have at least two eukaryotes and at least two prokaryotes. No singletons, we're not going to go there. We see this here, okay? So this, these are our 55 eukaryotes. These are, the, these are phylogenies. Each of these ticks is a phylogeny where we can say whether it's monophyletic or not. And uh, these are the prokaryotic, these are 1,825 prokaryotic genomes down here, and the gene distributions among prokaryotes for the genes that eukaryotes share with prokaryotes. We see several things. We see this big black line here. Now, these are plants, these are stromenopiles, these are, uh, this is uh, big luella. Would anybody like to guess what this big black line is here? Yes, that is correct. Who said that? Good job. That is it. Jeff McFadden wins the prize. These are cyanobacteria. These are uh, 70 cyanobacterial genomes right here. I got five minutes? Great. We're on time. Um, so that's interesting. Boy, you can, isn't, that, isn't that pretty? You can see the, endosymbi the, the imprint of endosymbiosis. In the, nobody's ever seen this before. And this is the first time I've ever shown it in public, so I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I am. So uh, look, look, look at this. Yeah. So this is primary symbiosis. This is secondary symbiosis red. This is secondary endosymbiosis green. Boy, how about that? Can you see it? This is archaeobacteria. These are the genes that eukaryotes share with archaeobacteria. Down here in the fraction of genes that are shared among all eukaryotes, this is the host. Now, I've said before, um, uh, eukaryotes share vastly more genes with bacteria than they do with archaea, and gene transfer, I think, is the mechanism behind that. And this is the evidence. This is the result. And uh, this is uh, quite a nice result here. The archaeal signal is there. It's uh, ribosome and uh, information processing informational genes in the words of Jim Lake, and boy, can we ever see it right there. Now, where are the mitochondria? Well, here are the heterotrophic eukaryotes, and here are the alpha proteobacteria, here are the beta proteobacteria, here are the gamma proteobacteria. Do we see a big, strong signal there? It's more diffuse. So let's ask these gene phylogenies. For each gene phylogeny, how often do cyanobacteria and alpha proteobacteria occur in the sister group yeah, in these trees? And the answer is here. All right, so here are plants, here are cyanobacteria, and the answer is for the roughly 1,000 genes where photosynthetic eukaryotes uh, are distinct, 38% of the genes okay, have cyanobacteria in the sister group to eukaryotes. 38%. It is clear and obvious that this is a cyanobacterial signal here. This is a plastid signal, but only 38% of the genes give us the branch that you expect. That is the imprint of symbiosis, and that is the, the, the uh, fluff that phylogeny puts on it. For the proteobacteria down here, here's alpha, here's beta, here's gamma, okay? The answer is 17%. It's older. It's a much older... Um, it's a much older event. Furthermore, the cyanobacteria are a much more uniform physiological group than the proteobacteria are. The proteobacteria exchange their genes all the time, right? They're very diverse. Cyanobacteria are not diverse. They're highly specialized. So what we see is evidence for symbiosis, the imprint of symbiosis, a weaker imprint the further back we go in time, and we see no evidence for other lineage-specific acquisitions. In particular, something that's been discussed at this meeting here today, do you see this white line here, this white line having no genes? It is chlamydia. 
Okay? None. Neither in the plants nor anywhere else. Spirochetes the same. There is no evidence for a major contribution from any other prokaryotic lineage other than the placid and the mitochondria. Furthermore, final, final statement, it's mass acquisition followed by differential loss. We do not see any evidence for lineage-specific gene acquisitions. And the bottom line, I think we can say, is that when we do this analysis and get the big picture, we have evidence for symbiotic origin, origin of eukaryotic genes through endosymbiosis followed by differential loss. And the bottom line of the story is that Yes, gene transfers from endosymbionts do occur, and lateral gene transfers that do not come from plastids and mitochondria do occur, but they do not contribute to the overall process of evolution. That's my story, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you.